everyone. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I'm Danielle, the Advice Manager at UESU, and today we've partnered with Housing Rights to help you learn more about your rights as a private tenant and how to resolve some of the most common student issues that we see, not only at the Advice Bureau, but those that we would escalate to Housing Rights as well. The Advice Bureau, for those that you don't know, um, is your free, confidential and impartial advice service for all students at Ulster University. We offer guidance and support um, on a range of academic, housing and welfare matters. You can get in touch with us via our online form at uusu.org and there you'll also find some information and useful resources um, on a range of the most common student issues, so please check that out. Um, I'd like to remind you that while everything is factual at the time of recording, just be minded that guidance, especially in relation to COVID-19, is constantly changing. So you should always revert back to the latest developments announced by the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Public Health Agency. So whether you are currently renting, living in university accommodation or considering renting privately in the future, you will learn a lot from this video. So please stay tuned for the main pitfalls to avoid and learn more about your legal obligations once you sign that tenancy agreement. It might also be useful for you to share this video with your guarantor. Um, in most of your cases, that would be your parents, just because there's some information in here that I think would be useful for them to know as well. If nothing else, by watching this video in full, you will be better equipped than most of your peers and hopefully you will have a positive rental experience. Um, and if not, then you should know how to address most of the issues swiftly. So I'll now hand over to Gail, the training officer for Housing Rights, who will take us through the session. Hi everyone, um, thanks to Danielle and everybody at the Advice Bureau for inviting us along today to talk to you all about your rights as tenants in the private rented sector. Um, I'm Gail Barnes and I'm the training officer with Housing Rights. Um, as an organisation, you may or may not have heard of us before. Um, so. Just to start off the session, I'd just like to explain to you that Housing Rights, we are an independent housing advice organisation. We give advice and representation um, to members of the public and um, organisations who are assisting members of the public. We have an advice line that's available for absolutely anybody to contact us um, Monday to Friday. And if you have any more questions that comes out of today's presentation, um, at the end of the session, we'll be able to give you um, contact details um, and you would be more than happy to answer your questions moving forward. The session today, we're going to take up roughly about 25 to 30 minutes of your time. Um, and during the session, we're going to really look at a tenancy from start to finish. So we'll look at how you can start up your tenancy um, and make it the best experience possible. Also maintaining your property ongoing. So we'll look at tenants and um, obligations as well as your rights as a tenant and also then your landlord's obligations as well. So really what your landlord should be doing for you during your tenancy. Um, and then we'll look at ending your tenancy correctly. It is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. So as I say, if there's any questions come out of today's session, please feel to con uh, free to contact ourselves or anybody in the Advice Bureau and uh, within Student Union. So there's a few things as a prospective tenant that we can um, give you in the way of hints and tips that things you should be aware of prior to starting your tenancy, which will help avoid any problems later on and um, down the line, whether it's during or at the end of your tenancy. Um, and obviously, as students with the Ulster University, you may already be a private tenant or you may be considering um, signing a tenancy agreement for your second semester in January. Um, so if you are going to be a tenant in the near future, some of the things that we would suggest that you are aware of are the likes of when you're viewing a property. If you're interested in that property and, and think that you're going to go ahead with um, whether the room in the property or the whole property as a whole um, is looking and asking for your landlord or your letting agent or state agent to provide you with a written inventory. The reason why we suggest this is a written inventory is really going to give you um, a, a written document that's going to um, detail everything that's being provided by your landlord in the property that you're going to sign for. And as I say, that, that whether that's the overall property or just even the room. 
the reason why we suggest it's a really good idea to have this document from the beginning is that when you come to the end of your tenancy, there's an expectation that those items that have been provided to you will remain in the property at the end of your tenancy and be returned in good work and order. Also, whenever you sign up for your tenancy, uh, we would suggest that you would uh, get a tenancy agreement. Legally, a tenancy agreement isn't required if your tenancy is less than one year, but it is a really good idea to have the document because it not only protects yourself, it also helps the landlord um, and it means that from day one you have a written document that gives you information on your tenancy, which includes the term of the tenancy, you know, the duration that you're going to be staying in the property, whether that's nine, 10, 12 months. Um, and obviously that term, during that term, there is an expectation that you will pay your rent in full and on time to your landlord. Also, it may include other tenant obligations. And um, so things that you need to be doing as a tenant or not doing, as the case may be, um, to keep your tenancy intact. Also, another term that we'd just like to highlight to you would be joint and several liability. And if this term appears in your tenancy agreement, it's just really to make you aware that not only are you signing up to pay your own rent in full in and in time, that is that you would also may be um, asked to either pay part or all of another tenant's um, rent should they walk away from the tenancy inside the fixed term. And this joint and side reliability will apply to everybody in the property but it also will apply to guarantors as well. So as a guarantor, um, whether it be a parent or another family member um, or friend who is signing as a guarantor on your behalf, is to make them aware that should the landlord not be able to locate the tenant who's walked away from the tenancy early, he, is with, he or she is within their rights to approach the other tenants and ultimately the other guarantors within the property. Landlord registration is another important thing to check out ahead of signing for your tenancy agreement. Um, since 2014, all landlords should now be registered um, as in Northern Ireland, and therefore you can go onto the website at any stage and check if your landlord is registered. And this will give you additional rights um, under legislation and protections under legislation. And finally, um, on this slide, with regards to certificates, Dependent on the property, um, the minimum you should be provided by your landlord is an EPC, which is an energy performance certificate. And also if there are any gas appliances provided by the landlord, so whether that's a gas fire or a cooker or a heating system, those gas appliances need to be checked um, and upgraded and maintained um, on a 12 monthly basis. So when you move into the tenancy, you should have a current gas safety certificate um, with a date of expiration. And at the, on that date or before, then that should be rechecked again by a gas safety engineer. The energy performance certificate is also a really useful document for you before you sign your tenancy agreement because it'll make you aware of how energy efficient the property is. And at this time of the year when we're getting colder, it's going to give you an indication of how much money it's going to cost to heat the property. So the higher the energy efficiency, the lower your, your heating bills should be. So prior to signing, just things to consider. Um, the costs involved, um, whether it's just the rent or are there rates to be paid as well, um, and also there could be other costs as well around fees from, from your letting agent or your state agent if you're not um, signing an agreement directly with a landlord. So ultimately, what's the, the total amount of money that's going to be included or required to be paid for rent um, and occupation of the property? Also about utility bills. Um, check everything in the property is there for you, the likes of internet connection, and also check who would be responsible for the payment of the bill um, for those likes of those utilities that are provided. And finally, contents insurance. Whether you're renting the full property or you're renting a room, we would recommend that you would look into purchasing contents insurance, especially if you are intending on bringing maybe expensive electrical um, appliances into the property like laptops um, or TVs, etc. Um, your landlord will be required to, to purchase buildings insurance, but contents insurance would be your responsibility. 
Other things that the landlord may require you to provide ahead of the tenancy or at the beginning of the tenancy. Mentioned already the likes of letting fees and um, there may be additional charges for um, the, for the uh, property. Um, and again, those would be documented in writing for you. Also, maybe key money. Um, certainly throughout the duration of the, the tenancy, if at any stage you were to lose uh, or misplace your keys to get a second set um, of keys, there would, could be a cost involved. Again, that cost should be documented in your tenancy agreement for you. Also, your landlord may request um, references or credit checks um, to prove that you are able to maintain the costs of the tenancy throughout the duration. And also possibly a reference will give um, the landlord information on how you have managed previous uh, tenancies. Um, so there will be a reference from either maybe the previous landlord or it could be family or friends. Also then any other fees that maybe come from the agent. Again, those should all be documented and you should be fully aware of those. At any stage, there shouldn't be those fees shouldn't be a surprise. Guarantors, we touched on them a minute ago, and a guarantor um, quite regularly now will be asked by a, uh, by a landlord to have some sort of financial backing and um, the likes of um, a homeowner. Um, again, a guarantor will be approached if a tenant doesn't pay their rent. Um, it's just as a, a fallback and a safety net for the landlord. So quite regularly now we are hearing of uh, landlords specifying that guarantors need to be homeowners again to have that financial backing. And finally, to get access to the property, um, it's now a normal procedure for a landlord to ask for a deposit um, and normally rent in advance. So when you're starting your tenancy, uh, one thing we're going to talk about is uh, your deposit protection and the legislation that protects you. We're also going to talk about tenancy agreements again in a bit more detail. Rent books, and also we're going to talk about HMOs, houses of multiple occupation. And depending on the tenancy and where you're staying at the moment, um, you could actually be in a property that's classed as an HMO. We're also going to talk about repair obligations and also touch on your rights as a, as a tenant. So tenancy deposit protection. There is now legislation in place that means that landlords, when they are get, receive payments for deposit from yourselves as tenants, must put that money into one of three organisations in Northern Ireland. And they have a timeline in which they must do that. So they must register the money with one of those organisations within 14 days of receiving the money from yourselves. The next step is then that the landlord must inform you in writing within 28 days, which of those three organisations they have selected to use. The reasoning behind um, a tenancy deposit protection, um, from a tenant's perspective, it's really useful um, because at the end of a tenancy, if there's a dispute around being uh, the money being returned to yourself, whether your landlord is only offering maybe a partial refund or no refund at all, then there is a dispute resolution service and that means there's a middle person who can negotiate and listen to both the tenants um, side of the story and also the landlords and they can then make a judgment or a ruling um, on where the money should go. So no longer is it just a case of a he said she said conversation between you and your landlord. Tenancy agreements and I touched on this really already but a tenancy agreement whilst it's not um, a legal requirement unless you're in the staying in the property for a fixed term of over a year. It is really good practice and we would certainly recommend uh, landlords provide this document at the beginning of the tenancy because it's going to set out a variety of terms in that document to give you a full understanding of your obligations and your responsibilities as a tenant. And it will also do the same for a landlord. So you should know what your landlord is responsible for doing or not doing as the case may be. Ultimately, if there is a term in your tenancy agreement that you're not happy with or need to get further information on, you can challenge a term um, if you feel that it's unfair and it's going to be challenged through the Consumer Rights Act 2015. Training standards are an organisation that are, um, right, cover the whole of the UK 
And if there is a term in your tenancy agreement that you feel is unfair, then you're more than welcome to contact ourselves or Trading Standards have a consumer line, which is a telephone advice line, which will also be able to give you advice on your terms of your tenancy. Moving on to a uh, right to rent book. Um, there was legislation was brought into Northern Ireland back in 2004, which then meant from that date onwards, um, any tenant has a right to a rent book. In days gone by, a rent book would have recorded any payments that were received in the way of rent from the tenant to a landlord. And certainly back in 2004, maybe a lot of those payments would have been handed in cash, maybe handed to a, to a landlord at the front door. So there had to be a way of recording those payments. Nowadays, any rent payments are normally transferred electronically through bank accounts. So there, there could be an argument to say that there's really not the same need for a rent book. But the important thing to be aware of is that from this rent book regulations in 2004 and 2007, both pieces of legislation require you as a tenant to get access to your landlord's contact details, even if you're renting a property through an estate agent or a letting agency. So at all stages, you should have full access to your landlord's details and those will be held on the rent book. An HMO then, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is a house in multiple occupation. And there is legislation to protect both tenants and landlords who are working or living in these properties. This legislation protects uh, tenants um, and there's new legislation in place that enforces standards for landlords and puts additional responsibilities on landlord's shoulders around providing policies and procedures, especially around the likes of fire safety or also antisocial behaviour. If you are in an HMO, those policies and procedures should be readily available to you. They should be left in communal areas whether it's a kitchen or a living area, um, for you to view at any time. Living in an HMO um, as a house of multiple occupation, there needs to be additional fire standards um, in place to ensure the safety of all tenants in the property. And since the, uh, the Act came into place in 2019, there's additional work that the landlords need to, to provide. So when it comes to repairs, in legislation there are what are called default obligations. So if you have a tenancy agreement, hopefully your responsibilities and your landlord's responsibilities around repairs should be detailed for you. So you know who has the obligation for certain repairs. If it doesn't mention it in your um, tenancy agreement or you don't have a tenancy agreement, through legislation, there are what are called default repairs or obligations. And that basically means that in legislation, there are certain things that a landlord must look after and certain things that would be a tenant's responsibility. So the default obligations for a landlord are the structure and the exterior of the property. So the outside walls, the drains, gutters, pipes, roof tiles, etc., would all be a landlord's responsibility. Also, a landlord will be responsible for the installation, for the supply and use of water, gas, electricity and sanitation. And also the appliances for making use of those as well would also be a landlord's responsibility. Any heating appliances that are in the property when you move in that have been provided by the landlord also will be the landlord's responsibility. Fixtures and fittings that the landlord has provided and any common areas should be kept in good repair, adequately lit and safe. And the last thing that a landlord will be responsible for would be the exterior paintwork. And all of those, as I say, fall through from um, legislative obligations. As a tenant then, what are your obligations? You must take proper care of your premises. So if there's any damage that has been caused by yourself or one of the other household members, or a visitor that's been invited into the property, then you must repair it as a tenant. You need to keep the interior of the property in reasonable decorative order, and you shouldn't carry out any alterations without your landlord's consent. 
So legally, your tenancy rights are you are entitled to a rent book, which, as I mentioned to you a minute ago, is really important so that you have access to your landlord's information. Also, you have a right to freedom from harassment and unlawful eviction. Harassment can um, be uh, um, detailed in various different ways, and certainly we have in housing rights have had experience of tenants where the landlord has opened the door and let themselves in or called in on a Saturday morning for a cup of tea um, or just really called in unannounced um, and that can be classed as harassment. Um, anybody who is a tenant in a property, unless it's an emergency situation, their landlord should be giving them about 24 hours notice minimum before they get access to the property. And whether that is just for a general inspection or for whatever reason, there has to be an agreement with the tenant in advance and I would say at least 24 hours notice um, being given. If it is an emergency situation, um, for example, a leak or a gas leak or a water leak or whatever it may be, then obviously in that instance, it would be a case of getting instant access to the property. But under normal circumstances, it would be a minimum of 24 hours notice expected. Also unlawful eviction, um, there is a process that your landlord must follow if they want to evict you from the property. And, and again, there's a step by step basis that they must follow, um, which is a legal process. So no, that is notice to quit and then your due process to, for eviction. Notice to quit at any stage at the moment during coronavirus um, uh, 2021. Legislation is in place to protect tenants and properties. So if you are asked to leave a property by your landlord before 31st of March 2021, your landlord needs to give you 12 weeks notice to quit. Normally outside of coronavirus, that would be minimum 28 days, but the legislation extends that to protect tenants um, during these un uncertain circumstances and times. If then at the end of the notice to quit period, um, the tenant doesn't move out, the landlord still needs to follow a process through courts to gain a possession order before they can gain access to the property. As a tenant, you are entitled to that process to be followed. Um, and one of the other tenancy rights that you're entitled to is as a tenant, you are entitled to apply for housing benefit or universal credit. So if you need assistance with, with housing costs and you're eligible for benefits, then your landlord should not be re refusing or putting any hurdles in your way to stop you applying for those benefits. So as I said, notice to quit um, is a minimum of four weeks notice. If it's being given by the landlord, if it's given being given by yourself as a tenant at the end of your term, um, you can still work with four weeks notice minimum. And just again to highlight with regards to coronavirus legislation up to the 31st of March, at the moment, all tenants must be given 12 weeks notice to quit by their landlord. So as a tenant, you have responsibilities. You must pay your rent in full and on time, and that can also include rates if applicable. You need to keep your premises in good condition and in good repair. You need to comply with the terms of your tenancy agreements. And again, if you feel that any of those terms are unfair, you can challenge those through trading standards. And at the end of your tenancy, you should be giving back peaceful possession of the premises back to your landlord. So just regards to contacts for housing rights, um, our advice line that I mentioned to you earlier on is open Monday to Friday, 9.30 to 4.30. And we're there to answer any uh, questions that you may have about your tenancy and um, any responsibilities yourself as a tenant or some may be questioning things that you feel that your landlord should be doing. If you need any clarification, we're there to help you. Also, outside of those times, we have a website that you can access 24 seven, which is called Smart Renter. And Smart Renter was launched um, to help anybody in the private rental sector, again, with advice on starting, maintaining or ending your tenancy. It also has some useful tools in there with regards to templates, maybe for letters, if you need to write to your landlord on a particular topic. 
and um, there's there's template letters in there for you that you can use and also information on inventories at the start of your tenancy. And last but not least, we have a mediation service which started with in housing rights just over a year ago. And rather than escalation um, of issues between tenant and landlord going to court, um, our mediation service can step in and free of charge can work with yourself as the tenant and negotiate with your landlord on any issues. So you've got some information with regards to contacts there. If you have any questions that come out of today's session, please feel free to contact us in Housing Rights or also Danielle or Declan will be more than happy to help you out as well. Thanks for listening today and hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.